Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, is the audio okay? Or it's kind of far? Something. Try it. It's kind of far. Try it in both. All right. That means this little one. Is it better? Better? Okay. About the same? Okay. All right. So we'll just start with this and then we'll pass it around. Okay. <clears throat> um, Alhamdulillah, we are here in the beautiful, mashallah, uh, I don't know if to say this will be the soon to not be a masjid or I, I can't really understand what's happening here, but mashallah, there's a beautiful masjid being built. So I don't know if next time we come, this will pass on to being, I don't know, a shopping center maybe, right? Mashallah, Abdul Shaheed, salamu alaikum. Mashallah, good to see you. <clears throat> so alhamdulillah, it's a blessing to be here. Um, I personally came here a couple of years back for the first time and it's it's very um, much like inspirational for me to be able to come and see now a structure being built over here and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your community because when people get together and work to build something uh, it really shows that Alhamdulillah Allah is joining the hearts to do something good and we hope that Allah is a wajal uh, allow each and every one of you to partake not only in building in this dunya but inshallah, I'm building for the Akhirah. So today, we have for you a treat. I think that um, any, anywhere we've done this sort of panel uh, set up, there's been many uh, blessings and we, we all share and, and benefit for the, from the time. Some of the youth that are here, uh, we hope inshallah that they benefit from some of the stories of uh, the people regarding uh, finding Islam, because many of us had to stumble in the dark. Right? We were not given Islam since birth. Alhamdulillah, you have been privileged if you were born into a Muslim family. Um, many of us had to commit all the necessary mistakes to find Islam. And, uh, and some of us were at the brink even of death. And if we wouldn't have found Islam, we may not even exist. So for us, as you'll see, Islam is something very valuable because we had to struggle for it. And we hope, inshallah, that you benefit from these stories. The brothers that are here are very diverse, as you see, not only inwardly, but outwardly. We have uh, a contrast uh, of, of, of different, mashallah, uh, outward colors. As you see, first and foremost, Latinos are very diverse. Okay? A lot of times people think all Latinos are Mexican. Okay? Mexico is one country. All right? It's like saying all the, it's like saying all Arabs are Lebanese. Okay? So we come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences. We share the Spanish language as the main language. Um, and the same is in Arabic and so on. There's different dialects and so on uh, from the Spanish language. But Alhamdulillah, we have all come together uh, to work for the sense of educating Latinos about Islam in the Spanish language. And that's something that we'll be doing tomorrow in the open house. Before we carry out that program tomorrow with non-Muslims, it's good that you know us as people who have walked into the masajid and at one point in time were not Muslim. And when we accepted Islam, the sort of challenges we went through, the sort of challenges we went through in finding Islam, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the way that we'll, um, the format and how this will work is that I'll ask a question. In the past, we have done this, uh, you know, based on everyone's background, they kind of tell their story and it takes a little bit more time. But today I hope, inshallah, to make it uh, a bit quicker and hopefully still get the benefits. We want to be able to have uh, each one of these people here on the panel, inshallah, and even from some of the sisters, we'll pass the microphone over there because <clears throat> there are more uh, sisters embracing Islam than men. So they're, they're uh, narrative is very important. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we just came back from doing a program in Colombia, South America, and in the weekend, four, four sisters accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah, we've seen that just about everywhere we go, mashallah, sisters uh, embrace Islam more than brothers. So we'll ask, and we'll pass the microphone over there and have them also share in their narrative because it's important. Uh, so the way this will work is I'll ask a question, kind of interview style from, for, for, from each one of the panelists, and instead of going back from the beginning as to how you found Islam and things like this, we'll talk about now. 
where we are at now in regards to our development, uh, in regards to the work that we do, in regards to the struggles we face, in regards to the hopes that we have towards the future. So we'll speak from now, and then we would like the brothers to contrast and think about the reasoning why before, when they were not Muslim, you know, how they used to look at things, you know, where they were regarding whatever is being asked, etc. So, let's begin inshallah, I'll begin from my right, then we'll come around. Um, we have Brother Muhammad Martin to my right, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Brother Muhammad Martin is from Brazil, originally. Um, he works in Microsoft currently, and he is by the Irving community. Uh, I would like to ask the brother about some of the challenges that he finds himself in today in regards to his level of development as a Muslim in dealing with the community dealing with the community and the hopes basically that he has and the reasons why he just came from Brazil as well in the World Cup and mashallah was out there doing uh, da'wah and so on so if you can share a little bit of that insight with us no problem Bismillah wa salatu wa rasulullah assalamu alaikum uh, thank you everybody for, for your participation as uh, brother Mujahid mentioned my, I do go by Mohammed Martins but my name is Felipe Martins that is my name uh, as the brother stated uh, I am a I'm Brazilian, born and raised, and uh, as our brother also mentioned, you know, a lot of the times people always ask, and just so I can get to the main point, they think Hispanic and Latinos. Does many people know the difference between Hispanic and Latinos? Anybody know the difference? Hispanic, Latino, are they both equally the same? Are they different? So basically, a Hispanic can also be a Latino, but a Latino can be a Hispanic, because in Brazil, do they speak Portuguese or Spanish? Portuguese so um, I'm a Latino but I'm not Hispanic but you know my wife is Honduran and I speak a little Spanish so I guess you can include me in the Hispanic realm as well um, so really that's an excellent question and uh, just to summarize it again so basically um, what are the struggles that I see now as a Muslim uh, converts uh, uh, some of the challenges that I see in the community as well as uh, what are some of the uh, I guess the opportunities for Betterment, is that, is that what yes. you're trying to focus yes. on? Um, I moved to Texas in 2010, my wife and I. Um, I accepted Islam in 2004, and uh, I was, uh, alhamdulillah, fortunate to go to Hajj a year after I accepted Islam. Um, and uh, we moved from New Jersey, met my wife after I came back from Hajj, and uh, graduated from college in 2006. And uh, like I said, I moved to Texas in 2010. Um, and this is a story that I share all the time because it's going to talk about a community and, and I pray that all the communities in the DFW is like this um, before I talk about the issues. But, and again, it's not to raise one community above the other. You know, we're all uh, Muslims. When I called Islamic Center of Irving, I didn't even know about ICI. All I know, I put the zip code in uh, Islamic Finder and Islamic Center of Irving happened to call the outreach office. There's a young sister there, a young lady by the name of Deli Ikambo. She still works there. Paid time, you know, paid employee of the masjid. Outreach coordinator. I said, sister, I am a convert. I don't know anybody in Irving. All I know is I'm driving from New Jersey to go interview at that time. I was at Blackberry for a position. Come. When I came, they met me. I had a brother there greet me. And I'm like, wow, this is a huge masjid. I have never seen a masjid this size before coming from Jersey, New York. I mean, anyway. So they said, brother, do you have a place to stay? And I said, no, I don't. We're going to arrange a place for you. They put me in a hotel for free for four days. I was in shock. I'm like, you guys don't know me. I just came from New Jersey. You're not asking me, are you an informant? Are you this while you're here? No, they said, welcome. And I really felt that genuine hospitality. And as a convert, I just melted. My heart melted. I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. And in seeing the community, meeting Imam Zia. So that was the first time a community has ever done something like that. Brothers went out their way. The first time I saw them, they were hugging me as if they knew me my whole life. Honestly, I'm like, I felt that. You know, one brother went out his way and all the other halal places were closed. He went out his way and he got food for me. And I'm like, Oh, this is amazing. May Allah bless this brother. So for me, that was a shocker coming from the East Coast. Anybody from the East Coast here? So, you know, you got a lot of people from the East Coast. <laughs> All right, Jersey representing over there. So, um, the, the, so for me, it was like, wow, this is something special. 
So let's fast forward, you know, um, uh, I got the job offer at that time. My, my wife and I moved uh, from New Jersey officially in April of 2010. And uh, basically, one of the main issues that I saw in the Dallas area as I got to go to Richardson, I remember I was telling the Imam, when I moved to Texas in 2010, I had come here briefly, I don't know if there was an event, and that mesha, that's mashallah, the beautiful mesha being built there wasn't even there. So, you know, and the community wasn't at all as packed as it is now. Like, I think it was, the numbers are mashallah, but, you know, when I came back to be part of the Islam and Spanish and the Spanish open house, I was like, wow, this is beautiful how much the community has grown. You know, may Allah bless this community, all the communities in this area, I mean. Um, but the main issue is now this. There's a lot of good. We cannot deny that. The main issue that I see now is the issue when we talk about when the person, he or she accepts Islam. Everybody's so happy, everybody says takbir. The problem that we're facing is, where is the follow through? What are we doing to actually help the people when they, when they embrace Islam. As we know, Islam is a way of life, but as the brother mentioned, even though we're Latinos, we're very diverse, just by looking at us. Just like when a person embraces Islam, they could be Hispanic, they can be white, they can be black, they can be whatever. But when we come into a community, a lot of the times, and I'm speaking from a convert perspective, okay? And it's not designed at all to offend anybody. I'm only looking at it from, I am an anthropologist, so I'm going to use that, and I'm going to look at it from an anthropological view. When a person accepts Islam, a lot of the times they give up, they give up a lot of things, okay? And the things that you're giving up is for the good. The main issue, especially for Latinos, we're very social people, okay? We're very, we're just very outgoing in general. I'm not trying to generalize, but in general, Latinos, we're very outgoing people. So for us, family, community, comunidad, familia is very important. So when we come into Islam, we had to give up a lot of friends and some of our family members because, you know, they don't know what's going on. Like, man, you're leaving my religion. What's up with you? Even our family members in the beginning, they kind of leave you as well. So when we come, everybody hugs you. And after that, where's everybody? Where's the community? That's the issue that I find that everybody hugs you, everybody says salams, and they use all these Arabic terminologies, like talk to you 100 miles per hour, you have no word, what's, what's inshallah, what's salam alaikum, you're throwing all these words at me, but we're not effectively working with the convert. So this is a main issue. Now, this issue, it can be rectified, and I think this community, other communities are working in that, and hopefully Brother Mujahid can keep me in the scope of the discussion so that I don't get off into a tangent. Um, the issue that we have to focus on is what are we doing to help the converts? Again, I told you, we're very diverse, we're very different. The main issue is social, friends, community. And again, and it's not to target one culture or one group, but when a person comes into a, a masjid, I've had many Latino converts tell me, you know, I go into a mosque, a masjid, and sometimes, you know, I feel like it's, you know, uh, I'm left out you know, uh, because I'm not part of their culture. I thought we were our brothers and sisters in Islam, but I'm kind of somehow left aside, maybe because, you know, I'm Hispanic, or I'm Latino, and I don't speak English. You know, now these are all feelings, they could be subjective, but a lot of the times I'm not saying people are doing this intentionally, right? No one's gonna leave a person out. It's natural that people tend to gravitate to their own folk. It's, it's normal. I may say a Brazilian, if I can, if I can just interrupt the brother right here, okay? You're getting a little bit, alhamdulillah, of the perspective, right? Of the person who embraces Islam in general, and specifically the Latino. If he becomes Muslim and he doesn't know the language, if he doesn't know English, he's going to come into the masajid and hear people speak Urdu or Arabic or any other language, and what that signals to them is that they don't belong there. Right, because like in Houston, there's a four-way stop. At every corner, there's a different church. In Southwest Houston, four-way stop, different church. One church is Filipino, the other one's Latino, the other one's African-American, and the other one's like Vietnamese or something. Now Houston's supposedly one of the most diverse cities in the US. Some have said the most diverse city in the US. But Sundays is a day of most segregation when it comes down to religious practices, right? So a person who is Latino 
and is going to church, they're not just going to the church where all the Latinos are. They're going to the church where the Salvadorians are, if he's Salvadorian. Or the church that is Mexican, if he's Mexican. Or the church that's Colombian, if he's Colombian. Down to the church, not only from Colombia, but from the city where the individual was in Colombia. Right? So imagine the shock that happens whenever they become Muslim. It's like the whole world is in here, but yet nobody speaks the language. So Jazakallah khair for your feedback. I'd like to go on and, and pass the mic over to Brother Abdurrahman. Now Abdurrahman is, um, has a unique background, to say the least. Um, I want Abdurrahman to share with you a little bit about the environment as to where he found Islam and what was said about the people who were Muslim in that environment. You don't have to tell them exactly where it was, just describe the place, okay? And, <coughs> and, and what was said about the Muslims at that point in time. Abdurrahman, by the way, is from Colombia, uh, very close to Panama. And um, anyway, you get to know him. Bismillah <laughs> rahman rahim So that is the brother was trying to describe that, that made me uh, a Latino. <laughs> so you can tell that's pretty unique. Um, so you want to want to know where the just the situation, environment, the environment, and, yeah. and what was said the about the perception about the Muslims? How you found out? Yeah. Um, well, the environment was pretty constricted, uh, but to the point that they used to tell you when and how, where to go, when to sleep, and what to eat. And majority of the procession of the brothers they were there in that particular place was the, they were nationalists. That's the feeling that they were nationalists. The brothers from, from a particular race happens to be Afro-Americans and a particular belief which everybody assumed that, that they were believing in a different God, right? In the in some kind of way they were another group they have a different God, a different belief. So was in that environment that you can have an idea, being from Colombia, I was not selling coffee, right? I was not selling coffee. They even accused uh, Juan Valdez to have something else than coffee and that little donkey that he carries. <laughs> so due to those circumstances, I end up in that particular place where they put people who don't sell coffee. And was there where I was able to learn about Islam. What was said about those people? How were those people who were practicing Islam? What did they tell you about them? What was particular about them? The unity. The unity was one of the points that attracted me to even start observing a group of them. Because I always noticed the three particular these three particular guys. Uh, they were hanging with each other. Everywhere that they go, I used to see them, three of them. So being in, uh, being in that environment, I, I uh, automatically concluded they were not, they cannot be homosexuals because they normally don't hang in trees. They hang either in pairs or, or group of fours. And the reason being that they don't want the other one to still, they, they, you know, associate. So I was observing these guys when another guy came by and saw me that I was watching someone. And he asked me, what was it that I was looking at? And I said, I'm trying to see these three guys. They always with each other. I'm trying to see if I caught them in a funny move, some kind of way. And he say, uh, oh man, no, they Muslims. These guys, the reason they act with each other is because they Muslim. They eat with each other. They always in each other's company. So he asked me what I knew about Islam, and he was able to explain to me that, um, that, that that was the reason. And I told them, it happens to be that I had been in another unit where I uh, was invited to one of the services. The guy spoke about one God like for one hour. And I told them that I went to them, and one of my companions, when I went happy to hear it was someone is speaking about one God for one hour. And I told my, my companions, he say, uh, I also went to one of the services, but they, they also believe in five different gods. The Muslims, 
and say five gods. This guy spoke up for the whole hour about one god. And you are telling me that they believe in five? Say, I already have a problem with three, so what, I'm going to add another two. So forget them. <laughs> so until that point where the brother rectified that I was no more than the basis of the teachings of Islam, and that issue was clarified, I was able to remain and continue going to the service. The five gods that they told him, this is in prison, for some of y'all who haven't got it. He was in prison, okay? They told him the Muslims worship five gods because they were equating the five pillars of Islam to five gods. Okay. Someone decide to teach this person the basis of Islam. The other way, the only thing that he perceives is what we understand when someone talks about pillars, we come from a background where we worship status. So when someone tells us about a pillar, we mean and understand that probably you guys go and worship some different five pillars in somewhere. So that's what he understood, that's what he went with, and that's what he went and told everybody else. Alhamdulillah. So see, he was doing that while the other way around. said, wow. You see, sometimes you have to look at things from other people's perspective, okay? <coughs> Alhamdulillah, you have Tawheed, and mashallah, you've been taught about Allah, and His message. This is beautiful. But you have to understand, when people come from another background, they understand things in a different way, right? When he ended up going to prison, he was there for how long? I did uh, nine and a half, uh, five on social status until I complete my degree called uh, sociality, uh, studying human behavior for nine and a half years. In Colombia, they call this, unfortunately, right, college or university, okay? Like going to, <laughs> going to this place is like studying human behavior, okay? Social studies, you understand? He was there nine and a half years. Uh, a person could have had a master's degree, right? A doctorate degree. So they call this the university, okay? In human studies. So, alhamdulillah, Allah guided him over there to Islam. And if he would not have had this, Allah knows best what would have ended up uh, being in, in regards to his life. One thing that I'll tell you, the day he came out, alhamdulillah, we met in, in, in Houston. And someone told him, hey, there's another Colombian guy that's out here. And, you know, he's telling people about Islam. So he came, mashallah, showed up and he said, hey, uh, I want to be able to let the people know about Islam. Uh, how can I help? Ever since then, for more than 10 years, alhamdulillah, this brother's been teaching the names and attributes of Allah for more than 10 years now. Just last year in one class, 37 people accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah. The brother's driving over here to Dallas every single month now to teach in the Spanish language here in Dallas. Uh, upon the second time he came, or first, second time, two, two people accepted Islam in one day. There's something about this deen, the power, alhamdulillah. Even though he hasn't gone back to Colombia, he was here in Houston making dua for Allah to guide his family. And in Colombia, Islam is very young, very new. And there's not too many people that can offer the information. And so upon traveling for my first time when I was in a new Muslim, my father, my mother, alhamdulillah, who, have, who had embraced Islam, and my wife who had embraced Islam as well. We were in a city three hours away from where his family lives. He lives in Buenaventura. And he told them that we were there, and his family, eight of them, got on a bus for three hours to drive over to where we were so that they could find out about Islam. This is the sort of stories you hear in the day of the Sahaba and the seat of the Prophet right? Someone heard about a messenger and they went to find out about this message. Alhamdulillah, his mother, his um, aunt, um, brother, and so on. Eight family members came and they could not believe that something could have changed his life because they remembered him when he was put in that place for nine years and a half. Now the way that they know him, he owns his own business, he has a family, he has children. When you deal with the brother, you can't tell that he's gone through that process. His etiquette is good, alhamdulillah. When they heard about what changed him, all of them unanimously, his mother and all the family members, eight of them, all accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah. So this is a ni'mah, alhamdulillah. Now, Brother Jalil. Okay, Brother Jalil, um, can you describe a little bit as to how we met and the, the thing that you told me when we first met? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Um, we met... I'm sorry, Brother Jalil is from Mexico, by the way. Right? He hasn't been here in the States too long. I'm but not yeah. from Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> um, 
Okay, I've been living here in, in United States for five years. I actually met uh, Brother Mujahid last year. It's been over a year. A little bit. A little bit yes. about a year. When I met him, um, actually it was very, very interesting because um, I was that day, I didn't know if I should pray in the message or if I should pray in my home. I got off early from, from work. So anyways, uh, I ended up being um, in Richardson and he was having, he was having a, a lecture at, at ICI. So at that time, you know, as, as our brothers are saying, sometimes we face uh, things as a, as a revert, as a new Muslim, you see things that are very, very difficult for you. So I went there, I hear his lecture, and I say, I gotta wait until he finished. I got away and, and I didn't know any other um, Latino Muslim. So I went until he finished and I went with him and I said, brother, thank you. The first thing that I say, thank you so much, brother, because I think I, I needed to hear uh, this message. So talking to him, I, I told him, brother, you know, uh, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like I'm the only Hispanic here. I feel like, like we should do something and, and I even uh, share a dream that, that Alhamdulillah, uh, nowadays is becoming true. Uh, I, told, I told the brother, you know, I feel like I, I, I want to learn more and I want to do something because I want to bring Islam to my hometown. I'm from Monterey, Mexico, and there is 150 Muslims over there in my hometown. And most of them are, are you know, immigrants from uh, Arabs, Arab immigrants. So he told me, you know, I don't know, like, in this world, like, I don't know what to tell you, but, but we're going to do something. If there is something that I can help you, uh, I'm going to help you. MashaAllah. So when I first met the brother, one thing that was interesting is that a Moroccan brother, I'm sorry, a Moroccan yes. sister. Yes. Right? Actually, yeah, the city. Yeah, a Moroccan sister in his college where he was attending had given him a CD from uh, Islam in Spanish. You know, these CDs that we've made in the Spanish language become a way for the transmission of the message, right? Whenever someone hands someone the CD, even though they don't know Spanish, a person may know Spanish and they may be able to take in the message. So he had not been here too long. So his English was not necessarily, you know, native and so on. So whenever someone gave him this, Alhamdulillah, he listened to it and soon thereafter he accepted Islam. So it was very interesting for me when I met him that when he saw the CDs on a table that he mentioned that someone gave him a CD. And so when he told me that he was interested in doing something for the people in his hometown in Monterrey, I, all I could say was whatever I can do within my own personal ability, inshallah, I'll help you. Because I saw in his eyes he wanted to learn and teach. And when people want to learn and teach, you gotta support them, right? You have to support them. And so, mashallah, that day I remember I gave him uh, a ticket. Imam Saraj wa Hajj, we were going to have an event with him over here with Norman Ali Khan as well. And, uh, and I told him, come. And one thing that I'll share with you, brothers, so that we all benefit from the way that new Muslims process, you know, their development of the deen. He was feeling pretty, I don't want to say sad, but he was troubled with the fact that he was working in a place where um, his role was um, uh, basically as a waiter and he was serving alcohol. And as a new Muslim, right? Bartender, yes. He was a bartender. He was a bartender. Not just serving food and some alcohol. Bartender, okay, where you serve the majority, okay, in alcohol. And so I remember him telling me, you know, he felt bad, right? Because he knows now as a, new, as a Muslim, he shouldn't do that, right? And so some of the people in the community had told him, that's wrong, right? Haram. When you're a new Muslim and you're making your living and someone tells you it's haram, do you know what that translates? Leave that which is given you, you know, your sustenance. It's so easy to tell someone that, but it's more difficult to tell them, let me give you something better. Let me give you another option. Let me give you a job so you don't have to do that. That's harder. That usually doesn't come across that way. Haram, haram. It's very easy. But the person who's saying this doesn't even know the struggle. 
So I remember he was feeling kind of bad about this. And I was like, listen, you're here by yourself living in, you know, the US. You don't have any family. This is the way that you're paying even to go to school right now. He was in college. I was like, keep your job. Do what you're doing because you have to pay your rent, right? But ask Allah to help you find a way out, right? You gotta be balanced, right? You gotta be practical. I'm not saying it's right. We feel it, but there has to be a gradual solution. So many sisters get kicked out when they become Muslim just because they wear the hijab. Somebody told them, you have to wear this hijab. It's almost like they don't wear the hijab, they're not Muslim. And then their parents kick them out, right? So it's very difficult. So when I, mashallah, I remember giving this brother this advice and I gave him a ticket. I said, come to our event. He came to the event and subhanAllah, on the table where he sat, you know, we had videotaped him and how he came to Islam or something. We showed it in, uh, in that event. And then the, one of the brothers that was sitting next to him happened to be a Moroccan brother who is married to a sister, mashallah, who is here today from Colombia. And they had actually given us a place to stay years back when Hurricane Rita was happening, you know, in, in Houston and we evacuated Houston. We stayed, mashallah, at their house without them even knowing us from Houston. This brother was sitting next to him and when he saw him there, he said, oh, you, that's you and so on. You know, oh, that's you. He said, let me give you a card if you ever need anything. And when he showed him the card, it was a restaurant called Kasbah. And he said, if you ever need anything, let me know. And he said, I'm actually looking for a job. And when they sat and talked, Alhamdulillah, not only did he, did he hire him, but he had been making dua for Allah to give him a job where he could pray. And Kasbah, if you know it, is literally in the parking lot of Irving Masjid, ICI. In this place where he now works, Alhamdulillah, he's been managing this place. And there, mashallah, being that there's this opening and understanding of his struggle trying to establish the deen. People have gone to that restaurant and now have accepted Islam with him in the very place where he works. Alhamdulillah, this is just a little point of benefit. When you have a new Muslim come into the deen of Islam, don't make things difficult because so many people embrace Islam and they leave, you never see them again. It may have been because a Muslim told them something that they're not able to handle at that time. They can't you know, carry that burden. So Alhamdulillah, since then, we saw him, mashallah, start learning, mashallah. We told him he has to sit with someone to learn personally. And now, mashallah, every Monday, I believe, he sits with Imam uh, Shpindim, mashallah, and he's learning. And now he's been working, alhamdulillah. How we were able to help him, we gave him material, gave him whatever support we could from Islam and Spanish. And just to conclude, his very intention at the very first day that I met him, he said he wants to give da'wah to the people back home in Monterrey. So he just found out about a sister over there that with a couple of people are going out to the streets of Monterrey and people are embracing Islam on the streets of Monterrey, this city. And they lack material. And somehow along the lines, they connected, got to know each other. And they just sent, subhanAllah, like 750 of our material over there, alhamdulillah. And these people are sending pictures with people embracing Islam. See how Allah works, subhanAllah. Taib, jazakallah khair. So we have Brother Abdul Razak. Brother Abdul Razak is uh, the khatib from today. You know, I was telling him he should have mentioned he's Puerto Rican in the khutbah because some of the people maybe thought that he was Arab. Okay? MashaAllah. Brother Abdul Razak is originally from uh, Puerto Rico, grew up in the East Coast, New Jersey. And uh, alhamdulillah, last year while I was traveling in Colombia, mashallah, he texted me and he mentioned to me that um, he didn't want to reinvent the wheel. He was doing work, alhamdulillah, with the Latino community in New Jersey, but he realized after a program that was set up here in Dallas with uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman and Sheikh Yasser Burjaz in Ramadan and Imam Saraj Wahaj, they were mentioning about the work this organization was doing and he, mashallah, saw it online and contacted me and said, you know what? let me go ahead and work with the process that you guys are working with over here in New Jersey. Tell us a little bit, Abdul Razak, about <coughs> Jersey, the way you looked at Jersey in your days of Jahiliya and the way you look at it now. SubhanAllah, in the days of Jahiliya, Jersey was just 
a place where we partied, uh, sold drugs, and womanized. Basically, this is what Jersey was for me. Um, never at all did I ever think that I would become a Muslim. Um, and looking back now, when they asked me when I was a non-Muslim if the world was to shake and the world was about to come to an end, what would you do? I told them I would run to the liquor store, buy me a case of Corona, and I would party my way out. This is the way I viewed life back then. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me to Islam. And through this guidance when we first came in, like the brothers up here said, we came, myself, I came to a masjid that was an all Arab masjid. And when I walked in, like what Brother Martin was saying, Assalamu alaikum, kayf haluka, jazakallahu khair, ma ismuka. And I'm sitting here and I said, Subhanallah, I made the biggest mistake of my life. The Imam, he gets on the member, he starts to speak Arabic. I can't understand not one word. There was no translation going on. I'm sitting there thinking, what have I gotten myself into? Until I met two other brothers who were from Guatemala, Hispanic like myself. And at that moment, there was not many Spanish people that we knew that was Muslim. It was a dream that we had, that we would be able to go study. That was my dream anyway, to go study and be able to give back to our people, to call our people to the religion of Islam. 17 years later, by the grace and mercy of Allah Jalla wa ala, not only has Allah allowed me to see this dream come true in New Jersey, but to be a part of the growing of this dream. In Jersey, by the blessing and mercy of Allah Jalla wa ala, the Hispanics are accepting Islam at a rate that is so fast. But we have problems. And the biggest problem we have, and I find this across the nation, is unity and working together. One of the things that I would like to advise you with, and if I give any advice tonight that you take heed to would be this. When that person comes up to the member and he takes his shahad and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and one of you guys yells, say takbir, and everybody, Allahu Akbar. And then everybody runs up and starts to hug and kiss this person. First, it's weird. I'm just telling you from a convert's perspective. Talk about men kissing men. Men That's weird. kissing men for us. and hugging men for us. It's weird. It's yeah. like, why are these men kissing me? and hugging me. That's not things that we, we don't do those things in the street. But more importantly is what happens after that. You come back into the masjid as a convert and that emotion you felt on that first day because of everybody hugging and kissing you and asking your name and what can I do for you and how can I help you and what do you need? You walk in the next day and nobody knows you. You barely get a salam. And if it's somebody like myself who has tattoos and I come in with a pair of shorts, short sleeve shirt, my tattoos exposed, the board members, they get together. Security, you watch this guy when he walks in. I don't know who he is. <laughs> this is a turnoff. And because of it, many people have embraced Islam and just as many have left. So we see that one of the biggest things in New Jersey is developing a team within the different masajids that meet and greet. Not everybody's qualified to do it. 
find those brothers who have that love, who have the characteristics, give them the job, and allow them to be your meet and greet team so that when someone walks in, just don't give them the gift of Islam, the shahada, but give them the nurturing that comes along with that. And this is what we're doing in New Jersey presently, trying to build on that so that inshallah ta'ala, the converts come in and they feel comfortable. And they leave comfortable. And they know that they can come back and they're going to find true help, true aid, and it's not just lip service. Alhamdulillah. Um, you work in an Islamic school as well, at some capacity, correct? I what, do. What years? I'm, teach, I'm a teacher in Islamic studies for middle school and high school, 7th to 12th grade. Taib. Now, the brother graduated from Mishkat University. He's, alhamdulillah, he studied some time in Medina University as well. And he's teaching in the Spanish language classes over there in, um, in New Jersey. And there's a street over there, Bergen Line. If you can describe Bergen Line real quick to them. Never seen anything like this, I don't think, here. Bergen Line, when you go Texas. to Bergen Line, it's heavy business district. And for about, I would say, four or five miles, maybe even more, because you go maybe from Union City all the way into Jersey City, maybe six, seven miles across on this one street. It is nothing but 99.9% .9 Hispanic owned businesses, completely. And for years, there's been a masjid there. But it's mostly an Arab masjid and there's no real outreach on a consistent basis to the people of that community. So when they see the Muslims, it just remains to be something foreign. Men who walk in with dresses, women who walk in covered up, and maybe to our people oppressed. And because no one goes out to speak with them, they remain ignorant. But I tell you, just three months ago, we set up in front of the masjid in Jersey City, which is about eight miles from this particular masjid or this area, a table, Islam and Spanish, the same tablecloth with a banner that has the different flags on it. The bus stop is right in front of the masjid. This was during Thanksgiving, actually, during November. The masjid decided to give away turkeys. And as the people walked off of the bus and they saw the banner that had the flags on it, they immediately came to the table. Oh, that's my flag. Where are you from? So I started speaking Spanish. I'm from Puerto Rico. Hmm? Uh, and, and, and the first reaction is that you're not speaking Spanish to them. So they start talking to you in English. And I start talking back in Spanish. And then, they, and then they, it finally clicks. Oh, he's speaking Spanish to me. And Allahu Akbar, some of the most beautiful conversations that I could have ever had. They start to ask, what is this building? What do you guys do in this building? Can I come here to learn about who you are, about what you teach? But they're just waiting for the invitation. MashaAllah, from this community, um They've tried to put tables out there to give material in English and no one takes it because <laughs> they only speak Spanish. It's, it's interesting. Here in America, subhanAllah. Um, so the Learning Channel has gone over there and also tried to cover a little bit about Latinos embracing Islam and so on. They've had a lot of coverage. And uh, mashallah, there's a sister from there, Nahila, uh, who just traveled with us to, uh, to Colombia. And alhamdulillah, she noticed something. In New Jersey, you have all this potential. You have masajid, you may even have some resources, but the work maybe isn't, isn't happening regarding engagement. She traveled to Colombia, even though she's from Mexico, she went out with a group of sisters to a, like a plaza, about 30, 40 sisters. And these people in Colombia never seen this before. She was mentioning that people were coming out of churches to take a look and see what these women were doing. And her son is 10 years old 
and he led them in salat, you know, in the middle of a plaza. And people just stood around, they were just looking at this. Alhamdulillah, on the weekend, the last weekend when we were there, four uh, ladies accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah. Many of the people who we find are inclined to accept Islam are people who haven't been presented the deen, but they're upon the fitrah. They're like close to their nature as human beings. And once it's presented, Alhamdulillah, they identify it. Uh, tomorrow's open house uh, will be the sixth time that we uh, do this open house this year. And Alhamdulillah, the last five times, each time one person has accepted Islam. Every single one person accepts Islam. We don't do it for people to embrace Islam, but we do it to educate, right? You show the information, mashallah, Allah has people who are just on the verge of accepting something, but they don't know what to cling on to. So, alhamdulillah, this brother, mashallah, right now is an educator, okay? Regardless of what you heard from him before, drinking and so on, and he has a background that if you were to hear it in depth, there came a point in time where he was lost in life. Even came a point in time where he didn't even, he was literally out on the street, homeless. To, to be in that point and then turn one's life around to be in the service of this deen, something to consider. For a lot of the young boys and the, young, uh, the youngsters that are here, realize that it's not only drugs, but also alcohol. It came to a point in time where he may have been an alcoholic, couldn't let it go. And we've known many of the people uh, in, this, in, in, in this same state. And I'll just end by saying this, the brother talking about how he has tattoos. There's a brother in, in uh, Houston. He used to be in a, in a gang and he was a rival to the gang that I used to lead. I was the leader of a gang when I was 13 years old in Houston. And this guy was from another gang and we didn't see eye to eye and we literally almost went to war on the streets. I had to leave to Colombia at the age of 16 because it was too dangerous for me to stay in America. When I get back, Alhamdulillah, find Islam, accept Islam and I'm sitting in a masjid. Someone comes and says, hey, there's a guy, he's been in a gang all his life. He wants to know about Islam. When I look up, it's the same guy that was my rival on the streets. And this guy walks in and he's like 350 pounds, big guy. And when I look at him, we used to call him also bear on the street. When I look at this guy, he looks at me, he's like, Jay? That was my street name. It's like, yeah. He said, this? Like, this? This is you? It's like, yeah. I said, what, what are you doing? He's like, man, I'm trying to change. I'm trying to change my life. I said, sit down, man. He had one glass eye because he got an eye shot out from a shotgun blast. He had a metal plate in one of his legs because he was run over by a truck. He had done four years in the penitentiary and he was living in a crack house and he was on heroin. I hung out with this guy for two days and alhamdulillah in my car he accepted Islam. The day I brought him into the masjid and had him do the shahada in front of everyone, as the brothers mentioned, Allahu Akbar, takbir, you know, this beautiful, you know, sense of community. But as soon as he went there by himself, people noticed that he had a tattoo on his neck of a skull with two blazing guns. You understand a skull with two guns blazing, like smoke coming out. And so people start saying, brother, your salah is not valid. So he came to me and he said, man, you told me as Muslims, we have to pray at the mosque. They told me my prayer is not even going to count. So, you know, I felt like, you know, tell me who this guy was, right? Let me find out who he is. Let me go talk to him. But it's like beyond the point, you know, because he went to another master and they told him the same thing. So while people are trying to run away from Jahannam to Jannah, the Muslims, mashallah, are the gatekeepers. And where are they sending them? Many times, it's so difficult. This guy started telling me, if I don't go with you, you know people know you're at the mosque. I'm not going to go over there by myself. They look at me weird. 
I was like, what do you expect? You only have one eye. <laughs> right? So you got to crack through this guy, you know? It's like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> right? And so, and sure enough, he left his glass eye on top of a, a table of his friend's house and the dog chewed it up. So now he didn't have an eye. So this guy, you see, we end up putting him, <laughs> we end up putting him in a rehabilitation center because the Muslim community doesn't have such places, right? They don't understand how to deal with these issues. We put him in a rehab center and for six months he was in there and it was only two brothers that could go visit him because the rest of the Muslims, we kind of kept him secretly. This is a secret brother became Muslim, he's over there. You can't talk to, you know, the Muslim community about this guy, right? Because the day he comes out, it's taboo. He's been over there with drugs and all this. No, I don't want him next to my kids. You know, I built this beautiful mosque to preserve my kids from this stuff that happens in society. Right? The people who gave us the ability to come to these lands, because my parents also migrated to America. Right? I was eight years old when I came here. We have the ability to come, alhamdulillah, benefit from education, benefit from having our businesses, and we build this beautiful masajid, alhamdulillah. But are these masajid like a gate to keep us away from the people out there? This is the very reason why the American public many times say, why don't they just go back from where they came from? Because they see the Muslims as people who come, only gather amongst themselves, go and deal with business, right? Make everyone outside like a market, sell to them, let me take your education, let me take your money, right? And then I go and retreat amongst my people. What kind of care can the people outside of the Masajid feel? So when a group of people don't look like they contribute to society, then it's natural for people in that society to say, why don't they just leave? If the Catholics were to leave America, you would have hundreds of hospitals shut down, right? So many nursing homes shut down. So many halfway houses, so many of the rehabilitation centers. But if the Muslims were to leave America, what would the American people feel that is lost in the environment? What social services? So we're a young community. Yes, brother. Was that? Oh, they couldn't find a good doctor? Ah, uh, that's funny. That's funny. Alhamdulillah. Anyway, this is food for thought. And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, the brother that I was mentioning, he's had his ups and downs in the community. And may Allah Azza wa Jal um, help him because it's a very tough way to integrate. Okay? And so hopefully, inshallah, you guys take it easy. Next time, guy comes with tattoos and all that. He's okay. a human being trying to change his life. And, 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 and not even that. Inshallah. Me and Felipe, we were in Brazil together. There was a brother in Brazil. Allah have mercy on him. He had tattoos all over his face. And when we first got there, he had this long hair covering his face because he was ashamed of his tattoos. We got there, he met us. He sees us with bald heads, beards, tattoos. Two days later, he shows up bald head. <laughs> Mashallah. He got confident. He felt confidence because he saw that there were people like him, people who would accept him. So this is what we're talking about. Imagine if we would have never met this brother. Subhanallah. Tattoos on his face. When he walks into the masjid, the first thing that people look at is, this guy had tattoos on his face. Mm. But he loves Allah and he loves his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Taib. Let's move it over here. Mashallah. How are we doing, brothers? Is this okay? All right. If you don't like it, we cut it off. <laughs> nah, alhamdulillah. We have brother Jorge over here. How long have you been Muslim, Jorge? Uh, just about a year. Just about a year, mashallah. We have a newborn baby here. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. Okay, so alhamdulillah. Jorge, what has Islam done for you in this one last year of your life? Inshallah, it's not your last year, but you know, <laughs> last year until now. From one year to now. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Islam itself kind of changed my life. Uh, right before I set my Islam, I was getting to a point that I was getting frustrated about everything. Like anything that wasn't going right on my life, I would just get angry. Uh, I even punched a wall one time. I was 
So uh, anything that somebody would contradict me, I would get angry. But uh, talking to brother actually, uh, Mohammed Martins is the one that actually kind of guided me to Islam. I, I knew a little bit about Islam because I going on co in college, I took a religion class to learn a little bit about more religions because I wasn't really happy with my own religion. I was looking for the right path. What religion was that? Uh, Catholicism. I was Catholicism. Catholic. All right. Yes. So um, I learned about Islam, the five pillars of Islam. I was like, okay, that's pretty good, you know. I liked it. So talking to Brother Muhammad, he would come to the store I worked in. We would talk about, uh, he would talk about Islam, I would talk about uh, Catholicism, and we would discuss points about each other and the similarities and the non-similarities. So one thing left to another. We were there at the store actually. Um, <laughs> actually, let me track back before, since I was already uh, doubting my religion. I started going to church every Sunday. I went back to my religion. I was like, I was born Catholic. I should die Catholic. That's what I was telling myself. So I started going to my church every Sunday. And the first couple of months, I was OK. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going somewhere. But the hype started going, dying down. So I don't know if you know about Catholicism, but uh, you, in Catholicism, you have to confess to a priest. I never liked that, but I was like, well, it's my religion, I should do it. So I went to the preacher, to the priest, I told him, well, I want to confess my sins. So I told them, you think it's wrong of me of thinking of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet of God? This guy didn't even know who Prophet Muhammad was. So I had to kind of explain to him who he was, what he uh, teach and everything. So the priest actually told me, no, I don't think it's bad. I was like, oh, okay, you just told me to leave your religion. I didn't, I didn't say that. I really didn't say that. <laughs> but you kind of just told me to leave you. So uh, I didn't took it. I kept going. So Prophet Mohammed, uh, I mean, Mohammed Martins came to the store like a month later. I was talking to him. And out of my own self, I told them, even though my religion doesn't accept Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him as a prophet, me as a person, I do. So um, that was it. Since Mashallah. then, I took my job. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, he, yeah. Mashallah. Mashallah. And since then, my anger has come down. I have become a better person. I try, every time I start to get angry, uh, say, Allah, help me, and it just goes away. Yeah. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. This deen is the deen, is, is a religion of peace, right? And so many of us, whenever we're confused and we don't have answers, we may act in a certain way to where it's misinterpreted and uh, a person may look like a troublemaker because they're asking questions about life, but Alhamdulillah, with Islam, it may soothe an individual because it all of a sudden starts giving you ways out. And so, Alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters, it is time uh, for the Adhan. MashaAllah, we have a punctual Mu'addin. I know this is the last, I've been here every time, MashaAllah, this Mu'addin is the most punctual Mu'addin I've seen in all the Masajid, MashaAllah. So right now, we have like 20 seconds before we're off. So brother, please come give the Adhan. Jazakallah khair. We'll resume inshallah right after Isha. Barakallahu feekum. The sisters can come back inshallah to the partition. Bring them up, brother. Don't delay his shahada. Oh, the sister wants to take his shahada. Or the brother. A brother wants to take his shahada. I know him too. Mashallah. <laughs> okay. As a brother who's going to tell each other, so brothers, you want to participate, inshallah, and we were talking about that. We're not going to bite you if you want to just <laughs> Yes, don't be afraid now. I met this young man, so remember, I was in the same situation like he was, and uh, it's intimidating. 
but uh, I'm gonna first of all, it's as we say, simmer down. <laughs> well, you know, I I forgot your name, but I think you remember mine. My, my name is Mohammed. Mohammed. And I'm just Eric. Eric, just tell him. I think we met at an event, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we did. And obviously, he knows uh, Brother Nidal, and he knows Sister Ruba. Sister Ruba is a teacher at a, at the Islamic School of Irving. Um, so just tell everybody your name. My name is Eric. And Erica, where are you from? Plano, from Dallas? I'm from Ohio. Oh, that's oh, right. He's from Ohio. 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 And, uh, and so basically no one here is forcing you to be a Muslim, right? Contrary to the belief, right? Not at all. Like I said, when I met him, he was with some of his friends and, you know, uh, he was actually, you know, just you know, hanging out and, you know, and he said, yeah, you know, I'm just trying to figure out and learn about Islam. So pretty much somebody has already told you about what the Shahada is, right? Yes. Okay. So what we're going to do at this moment, we're going to basically, um, I'm going to explain it to you in English and then we're going to say it in Arabic. So what you're going to say is, I bear witness. I bear witness. And testify. And testify. That there is no deity worthy of worship. That there is no deity worthy, worthy of worship. Except. Except. Allah. Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Prophet Muhammad. That Prophet Muhammad. Is the final messenger. Is the final messenger. So now we're going to basically say it in Arabic. And after that, I mean, you're a Muslim, but now we're going to say it in Arabic. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An la. An la. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. Wa ash. Wa ash. Hadu. Hadu. Anna. Anna Muhammad Muhammad Rasul Rasul Allah Allah Congratulations Takbir Allah Allah Takbir Allah Congratulations man I'm very happy for you bro That was a big surprise man big surprise. That means Allah is great okay though okay. Yeah don't go run off anyway <laughs> Some people get scared by that no, not So now I think you're gonna get hugged by a lot of people But we were just talking about that That's usually an intimidating It happened to all of us When I took my Shahada It was Ramadan I first took it at my college, then my neighbors grabbed me, took me to the masjid, and it was like packed. You know, Ramadan is, you know, tarawih. So imagine, I got hugged, but I don't know how many brothers that day, and I was like, whoa, a lot of dudes are hugging me today. But we're very happy for you. Um, and obviously, you know, we're, you know, uh, who, who are your friends, Nidal and, and Ruba? Who, do, are your friends here tonight, or, or no? Maybe they're here, I'm not too sure. Okay, and, and how, do you know, how did you know about this community? Um, this is actually the first masjid I ever stepped foot in um, oh, wow. last Ramadan. Oh, wow. So this is very important. So that means, you know, uh, everybody that's here that got to witness this, you know, please make dua for our brother. And basically what we were talking about, for those that were here before Maghrib, what was the first thing we said, right? After the takbir is the big work. So just, I know this masjid, the Imam mentioned that there's an Ansar program. So Ansar is basically like a companionship. We have that in ICI as well. So we want to make sure we help our brother and we can provide him whatever resources. And I don't know if there's anybody that... He's from, uh, from, um, from Dallas, right? Yes, I live in Dallas. Yeah, this, wow. this is a yes. gift for you yes. Yes. from well, this community. You. Don't be thank scared you. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you guys want, I mean, I don't know if you have somebody that can yeah, yeah, take his info yeah. and kind of just stay in contact with him. Again, brother, we're very happy for you. If you want to stay for the event, please, please do. And really, when I saw him, I'm like, hey, I know that guy. I remember him. And they're like, oh, he wants to become a Muslim. I'm like, that's awesome. Congratulations. You're very welcome. All right, mashallah. Congratulations. Yeah. Hey, he wants to give you a hug. You got to give him a hug. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Salman, I guess we were right, huh? Say it in Oh, yeah, mashallah. No, no, no. Don't speak the guy. Oh, the same conference. So the brother was in the same conference for Islam in Spanish, right? But obviously he's not Spanish. But it just goes to show you that when we, when we put our effort... You know, uh, this is a blessing from God. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him, keep him in the straight path, and, uh, and, and protect him and protect all of us, and we're very happy for him. And uh, it's a blessing that everybody got to witness that. Alhamdulillah. Should they hug him and stuff like that? Should they welcome him? Yeah. I mean, hey, if you guys want to go welcome the brother, please do, man. Don't hold on. Don't hold on. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not trying to tell you, though. I mean, welcome. It's okay. Welcome. It's okay. 
<laughs> I think they took a little when we told them. They're like, I don't want to hug them. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. You can welcome the brother. Alhamdulillah. You're more than welcome to welcome the brother. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Which, by the way, I mean, it, it does feel brotherly, right? To, to accept Islam. I mean, as we were talking about. See. When we embrace Islam, Alhamdulillah, it's a ni'mah. Yes, you have brothers from different backgrounds hugging you and everything. Um, if you kiss a man who's never been kissed before, you may get a different reaction. Uh, <laughs> the day I accepted Islam, I was in Florida, and there were about 1,500 people in a mosque, and uh, it was an ishtima. So you know in an ishtima, everyone had spent the night, right? We're in the morning. So my perception of the people there is that they were lining up and they were in their pajamas. This was my perception because I spent the night there too. So, so I'm like, wow, all these people spend the night together. Even in pajamas, they line up to kiss me on both cheeks. And they gave me prayer rugs. And they gave me a cologne. And they gave me the, you know, a miswak. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this stick. But there's a reason why they gave me this. You see, everything's like there's wisdom behind what these people do, right? Uh, but alhamdulillah, no doubt, the heart feels as if you've joined the brotherhood. And so later on, you come to realize, mashallah, people's different dress and the fact that, you know, kissing men wasn't uh, like we understood kissing men back in the streets. Would have been fighting, right? It would have been an issue, alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Okay. So, is this? Este es. Este es el. Okay. Este tiene este un long reach, pero tiene okay. que usar ese. Este, este, este va para allá. Ok. Jorge va a pasar este por allá, ¿sí? A una hermana. Sí, a alguna hermana se le puede pasar esto acá. ¿Se puede empezar con, con tu esposa? Sí, sí, sí. Ah, ya, yeah, excelente, excelente. Ok, so, mashallah, you're more than welcome, brothers, welcome the new brother, alhamdulillah. We will also proceed, however, because we only have about 20 minutes, inshallah, to complete, uh, to conclude. So, um, at this point in time, we'd like to pass the microphone uh, to the sister side. Uh, the sister side is very important, by the way, because, as we know, alhamdulillah, the women, not only in this community, but in society, if you have, alhamdulillah, strong women who teach and mashallah have an identity where they identify with being the educators of not just their community, but starting with their own children. I mean, they're teaching the next generation. We have seen that the people who embrace Islam and somehow, the other one, this one? No, it's okay. He has another mic he's talking about. Is this one right? Will it work? That one will work, I think. Yeah, maybe we see. MashaAllah. Too many wires. Okay. You good? Is this on? This is not on. Yeah, it's on. Okay, khalas. Okay. Um, este lo vamos a pasar para allá, para las hermanas. Si quieres pasárselo a tu esposa. Okay. So, alhamdulillah, the, the women in this ummah, alhamdulillah, if they are strong in their deen, alhamdulillah, we can expect that our children also will be educated, right? The woman, the mother is the very first school of our children. So it's very important that we look at the other side. Alhamdulillah, after I embraced Islam, my girlfriend embraced Islam. Okay? I had a girlfriend. I wasn't Muslim. Okay? Is that all right? Or haram? <laughs> haram? Not haram. It was halal. I didn't even know what halal haram meant. It was all fine. Alhamdulillah, I embraced Islam. And I feel something in my heart. I said, either I'm going to be serious with my girlfriend or I'm not going to have anything to do with her. No one told me halal haram, I just knew. Embracing Islam was serious. And alhamdulillah, she embraced Islam a week after. And she was like, listen, I don't want this boyfriend-girlfriend situation. If it's serious, then we do something about it. Alhamdulillah, within a month we got married. And alhamdulillah, soon thereafter, um, her little brother accepted Islam at the age of 16. And then we went to 
uh, deal with my parents. My father accepted Islam and then my mother accepted Islam. And Alhamdulillah, then her mother accepted Islam. So it's a ni'mah, but believe me, it didn't happen easily. Uh, my parents thought I was brainwashed. Um, her mother thought uh, she would never go with her anywhere in public if she wore the headscarf. And she did leave her uh, whenever a, a cousin graduated. She said, I'm not going anywhere with you dressed like this. And she would leave her. And, you know, my wife was crying and things like this. But Alhamdulillah, eventually, she, my, my mother-in-law accepted Islam the day my first daughter was born in the hospital. Because she realized life can only be given by Allah. And she loved this baby so much. When I asked her, who created it? this baby she said God and I said why don't you worship him by himself and that's the day she accepted Islam so Jazakallah khair we're going to ask uh, mashallah brother Muhammad Martin's wife sister Gabby who, who mashallah is one of the volunteers for this event today and tomorrow uh, let's ask her about her mother okay Khalas, we'll just leave it to that her mother <laughs> So uh, just um, again, I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, it's very important. We had this set up in um, Islamic Center of Irving where the sisters are part of the panel. We got to keep one thing in mind that um, that women tend to be amongst that demographic, regardless if they're white, black or, or Latino. They're the fastest growing populace within the Ummah, right? So um, we want to make sure that um, that their voices are also heard. And uh, just to stress the point, just because real quick, you know, um, um, my wife, you know, she's originally from Honduras, um, and uh, she's a person who accepted Islam at a very young age. You know, we've been married now, it's gonna be close to 10 years. I, uh, obviously we know in Yom uh, Arafah and Hajj, everybody makes so much dua. I was making dua, Ya Allah, provide me a wife. And Alhamdulillah, sure enough, when I came back from Hajj, got to know of a Muslim Latina sister who embraced Islam and it's just a funny little thing because the day I came back I went straight to the Muslim Student Association and I was active within the MSA right anybody here active in the MSA or was active in the MSA okay one person back there so you know it's it's a very you know uh, camaraderie that you build up so uh, they're like hey this is sister Gabby you know I just came back you get that Iman rush you know at that time I had the beer rocking down to my belly and um, you know they're like hey you know and then when I got married to my wife my wife would say do you remember the first time how I looked? I'm like, listen, I was so shy to look at you because she wasn't wearing hijab. But I just remember your rainbow colored socks because that's what I was looking. <laughs> that's what I was, I remembered. Um, but uh, I remember the next day we had a gathering and she decided on her own to wear hijab. And like Brother Mujahid said, many women are kicked out of their house, not because they're drinking alcohol, not because they're with boyfriends. My wife was one of those persons that they had no problem with her being a Muslim, but the minute that she put on that little headscarf, she was thrown in the street. So I'm gonna pass the mic over to her um, again, so that um, as Brother Mujahid had uh, mentioned the question about my mom, I mean, my mother-in-law, because that adds into it, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass the microphone to her. What am I doing with this mic? Uh, oh, that's, pass yeah, pass it as well. <laughs> it's for the, it's for the camera. Sure. So you just heard her mother kicked her out of the house, right, for wearing hijab. Remember that, okay? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, Jazakallah for your patience. Uh, mashallah, you've been, you've done wonderful. Allah's with the patient. And I just want you to benefit from our stories. I just don't want you to take it for granted. Because a lot of born Muslims, you know, they hear our stories and they say, Mashallah, you know, this is great. Like, you know, we have all these people coming from all different directions of, of the world with, you know, all different backgrounds, you know. And then we go home and then we go, our, the next day comes along and then we forget, and then we see somebody in the street, you know, we see another Muslim, and it's like, it never happened. So I just wanna advise everybody, you know, to, don't take this for granted, you know, this is also to benefit. I'm gonna make a combination between the story of my mom and I. Uh, my mom, I'm from, originally from Honduras, from the main capital, Tegucigalpa. Um, I was raised there until I was seven years old. Uh, prior to that, my mother, um, her life has been very um, tough since she was, she was born. Um, at the age of eight years old, uh, her mother passed away, my grandmother. And her, uh, her father, my grandfather, he pretty much sold her to a, doctor, uh, to a family of uh, professors. 
and she was pretty much um, lost and heartbreaking, you know, um, because as a young girl, she had to be alone without a father and without a mother. And in her life, like she re relates to me, you know, she had to give herself education. She had to self maintain herself, you know. And she worked for this couple uh, for maybe until like 15, 16 years old until she actually bought herself out. Um, uh, years later, when she turned 18, she had me. And it was really difficult for her and my, my father to establish a family. So we actually lived in a mountain covered with um, a pretty much just uh, wood. Okay. And she couldn't sustain us. It will sustain me. She couldn't maintain me. So what she did is that she made the decision like every immigrant makes. Let's go to the USA. You know, I'm going to find a better life there. So she left me in the charge of my father at two years old. Since then, I share this with, you know, some sisters, you know, um, love your mother, you know. There's nothing in the world to have a person, you know, next to you who will always console you as your mother. She left me, you know, and I felt like my story was repeating again, you know, like hers. Um, I felt unwanted, and I did hold a grudge against my mom for many years. Um, when she came to the U.S., like everybody else, and I'm not going to go in detail, but she went through struggles you know, in the border. She crossed the border, she made it to California, she was able to get herself to uh, New Jersey, she established herself there. When she lived there, um, her life was turning upside down, it was culture shock, just like I had a culture shock when I came at seven years old to the U.S. You see all these, you know, people from all over the world, you know, and, you know, practicing their religion. And things that she never had in Honduras, she wanted, she, it was experimenting to have them here in the U.S. So, you know, she would go to clubs, she would go to parties, um, she would dress, you know, uh, without caring, you know, what she would be, you know, showing off. Um, and it was a very, when I met her the first time at seven years old, I was very disappointed. I, you know, I felt like, you know, for me she was an embarrassment to the point that I wouldn't even share the same play with my mom. That's how bad it was. Um, I was raised Catholic by my grandmother and my aunt. I lived with my cousins. My life was very humble. You know, we made trips to the rivers. You know, um, I was raised in a Catholic church. You know, our, our priests and nuns were pretty much taking care of us, teaching us about religion, the Trinity. Um, I never really was taught about prophets or their life, or, you know, why we have to do things. It was just, just believe it. And I thought it was, okay, it's easy, just follow. Just follow the wave. So when I came to the U.S. at seven years old, and I, um, I tried to hold on to the little that I knew about religion, you know, with my parents, my parents didn't practice. They just didn't care, you know. Um, for, from coming from a very humble place, from a mountain to a city, and, you know, having everything accessible, you know, uh, drinks and, and, you know, men. Um, Alhamdulillah. Um, witnessing things as a young child really impacts your, your life. And I thought, you know, why, what is this world? Why, why am I here? You know, what's the point of me being born? if I'm going to be going through this. What's the point of this life? So then I forgot about religion for a moment. Uh, when I was in high school, I <laughs> became like a punk rocker. You know, I, you know, for me, my identity was, you know, listening to heavy metal, identify with the, with the message. You know, it was, even, even though it was shaitan advising me, do this, you know, flirt with suicide, you know, go out, drink, it's okay, you know. Just live your life. No one cares. No one cares about you. So I was doing things um, to displease my parents. Alhamdulillah, my father has an army background. Alhamdulillah, he did keep me in check. He would tell me, you could do whatever you want as long as you don't, you know, uh, get high or, you know, come, you know, bring a boyfriend. That is one thing he did not want me to do. So um, my father is very, uh, mashallah, like in your face. So. Uh, he'll make a point like he's like I don't care if I have to go to prison I don't care if I have to die if it's the last thing I do I just want to make sure that you don't give yourself right so after high school I went to Montclair State University the same university that my husband attended 
And there I was uh, a major in anthropology. And I was not thinking about religion, you know, I was just taking uh, two classes, cultural anthropology and general humanities. General humanities was pretty much learning about um, beautiful literature, you know. And cultural anthropology uh, was teaching the aspects of the background of a culture, the, the history. So in a very, very small paragraph, like this much, uh, they very quickly just said, um, Islam is the last, it, it was, it's uh, the religion that Muhammad started, you know, and he was the general of uh, this nation. That's all. And then when I learned, and then when I read from a non-Muslim textbook, the chapter of Yusuf, that is the surah that introduced me to Islam. That is the only thing I knew about Islam, Surah to Yusuf. And I, let, I read it in English. And for me, that story really hit me because it contemplated me, it consoled me. It took me out of my depression in a second. And I thought, I need to know where this came from because I am uh, to the pit of a point of suicide. I'm to the pit that I don't know myself. So. Uh, when I look into it, and they have the footnotes, you know, this is from the Quran, I look into the Quran, then I'm like, what is the Quran? Then I look, okay, this is from Islam, okay, so I try to put, you know, two and two together. I'm like, okay. And then one winter, it was, um, uh, um, I was in my apartment, it was my, I was in my room, and I was just Googling, how can I become Muslim? I want to learn how to become Muslim. So then I contact a brother from the MSA, but he was not, con uh, he was not replying yet. When I found out how to take the Shahada, I took the Shahada by myself. I learned how to become Muslim by myself. I didn't have any Muslims around me. I, I was so ignorant that I thought only Afghani people were Muslims. I thought like Arabs were not, you know, Muslim. I thought they were Christian or Jews or whatever. I thought that only Afghani, because that's what I saw in the media, you know, like the Afghani boys, you know, like reciting the Quran, the way they, you know, rock themselves back and forth. So I thought that was the image I was given. And, um, when I was reading, you know, the Shahada, I was saying, you know, I identified myself like that. I want to fit that description of a Muslim, someone who submits to God alone, you know, with no partner, you know. And at one point, I didn't want to go back to Christianity, but I said, you know what, Christianity was so simple. I could practice it, that's fine. It was so simple, but yet I couldn't stay. It was really hard for me to practice. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't continue going to Mass and lying to myself. So then I took the Shahada later on with the brother, you know, he asked me, this was all MSA, like um, um, AOL, you know, he was saying, okay, you say this and you're a Muslim. And I said, okay, I said this, I believe this. You know, he's like, okay, now you have to learn how to pray. So I'm like Googling everywhere, where can I, how can I pray? And I started le learning how to pray on my own. Then he invited me, he said, come to the MSA, there's going to be, you know, an event, it's good for you to know the Muslims. And for the first time I met the Muslims. And I go in, and alhamdulillah, the sisters that I met and the brothers that I met, alhamdulillah, they were in their deen. Alhamdulillah, they show me that clear, you know, uh, image of Islam. Alhamdulillah, you know. They say, you know, Muslims are not perfect. But when I see all the, these sisters and brothers practicing their deen, I think they were perfect. They reminded me, even though I didn't know what sahabas were, you know, like how to say it, but when I was reading about the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I said like, wow, you know, like they, they remind me of Abu Bakr, you know, they remind me, you know, the sister reminds me of Abu Bakr. She's so gentle to me, you know, no one has ever spoken to me like that. She, she's so willing to teach me. Uh, sister, how long ago was that when you embraced uh, Islam? It uh, was the end of 2005, December 2005. 2005, okay. Tell us about your mother now, because okay. we're like three minutes away from 10 o'clock. Okay. So, Bismillah. and we were, yeah. So, what happened with your mother? Okay, so then, in regards to Islam. So, then with my mom, um, a week later, I told the first person I told was my father. I became Muslim, and he said, That's fine, you know, as long as you're happy, you know, practice what you believe. And then when I told my mom, you know, she was just like, Okay, you know, whatever. But then, Right, the next day, after I took my shahada and I met the Muslims at the MSA, I wore the hijab right away. And my father, uh, on a Friday night, he took me to the church and he told me, if you, don't pra if you don't practice what we believe, which they didn't even believe anything, they didn't practice anything, you're not welcome here. I'm getting your stuff out and you're out. So I was in the street, literally, like on the cold. And subhanAllah, the lady across, you know, she's like the lady that nobody likes in the neighborhood. She's the one who Allah put her in my path to hold, uh, have me over. 
and I stay with her for about a month. Then later on, I move on with a, a couple of friends who were, you know, practicing Christianity, and you know, would pray in between like their saints and everything, because I had no other place to pray. I mean, some Muslims telling me, "What are you doing? You have to get out of there." Well, no one's taking me in. The Muslims are not taking me in. What do you want me to do? So, um, you know, I would pray. So then, my mom, Subhanallah, um, there was a time that when I came back, when she asked me to come back and live with them, you know, she became overwhelmed for like how was I practicing, and she actually took, threw the Quran right in the garbage, and she wouldn't allow me to pick it up. And I told her, why are you doing this? You know, it's not harming you, it's not doing anything. So she said, you know, this is all from Satan. You know, I don't, I don't believe in this. And I said, you know, this is very beloved to me. You know, this has changed me and it will change you. So then later on, you know, alhamdulillah, I met my husband and for some reason, you know, we had said, okay, we're gonna get married in a year. Then it was a six months, then it was two months because things were really getting heated up at home. So alhamdulillah, we got married. And then throughout these 10 years, you know, we were like on and off, you know, in good terms, bad terms, because still they were trying to like, you know, see if I was really serious, if this was a phase or not. Well, she's married now, now she has a kid, you know, so it's gotta be really serious. And alhamdulillah, just last year, she accepted Islam. She said, I had a dream and I couldn't take it. I could not uh, disregard this and, uh, and I couldn't put it on the side. I had enough of this dunya. I want to accept Islam. Alhamdulillah, she took shahada last year. She had a dream where um, she was in a white room and she says that there was two men in her room. And one was uh, speaking to her in Arabic, but she couldn't understand. You know, they were just speaking Arabic and she was just nodding like, yes, you know. And she says that the, the room became constrained, you know like kind of like pressuring her, like you gotta do this, you gotta take this. So all of a sudden she, she, just, she just realized that, you know, from everything that I've explained to her about Islam, she kind of said, this is a religion that my daughter is telling me about, you know, so I'm gonna embrace it. She woke up, the minute she woke up, she was just looking for any sister so she can take her shahada. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, you know, last uh, time whenever we had the open house here at Irvin, um, I heard that not only had her mother accepted Islam, but she went back to a place in Honduras, um, a place where very few people have access to go into, let's just say, and uh, took material to start telling people about Islam back in Honduras, all on her own. This is like, I don't know what's equivalent here, what's a place equivalent here in Dallas? I don't know. Yeah. I tell you, like Houston, it'll be Fifth Ward or something, huh? Present group. Okay, possibly. It was a rough area, so for her to go there, right, and want to tell people about Islam, it's something that, Subhanallah, when you hear the story, you you see the curve, right, that happens. You can literally see how Allah as a wajal changes the hearts, flips the hearts, right? One day a person wakes up a disbeliever and goes to sleep a believer, and not only that goes on this search to want to be able to educate people based on what they don't know. So Alhamdulillah, last time we were here, the sister was mentioning that she needed material. It's the common theme, right? You go back, you may not have too much information. People who speak Spanish don't, haven't received this information. So Alhamdulillah, it was, it was a blessing for us to be able to leave uh, some material behind so that she could actually send it to her mother. And uh, now people in Honduras are receiving the information. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, sister. Thank you so much. Um, may Allah bless you and your family. And um, I know that we are at 10.03. And uh, the timekeeper, uh, Brother Iftikhar, said we can do up to 10.15. I don't want to overburden people, though. If you guys are ready to go and want to go, you're more than welcome. Uh, to close, uh, there is one sister that I just wanted to... You can take There is one sister just to close. There is a sister named uh, Jolanda. She didn't know she'd be called upon today, but uh, Sister Jolanda is from Colombia, actually. Um, she is uh, married to a brother from Morocco. They uh, are owners of Casbah Grill. 
Uh, it's not a plug for the restaurant, but uh, how I came to know them is because they opened the doors uh, for my, my family whenever we didn't even know them. There was uh, Hurricane Rita uh, had us evacuate from uh, Houston, and it took us uh, 19 hours to get from Houston to Dallas due to the traffic and you know people were breaking down in between so she mashallah allowed us to stay in her house since then we came to know each other and then as I mentioned brother Jaleel eventually went to work there um, so sister Julanda is there anything that you want to say to finish up with any of this that we've mentioned as a, as a, as a convert as a Latina as an educator now you're a teacher at, at Irving correct you, you teach in Islamic school uh, you're a business owner, et cetera, et cetera. Any feedback you have or anything, Ishaan? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, mashallah, everything has been said. Alhamdulillah, we have amazing speakers. And I agree with all of you. Yes, uh, absolutely. The afterwards, um, it's extremely important. If we don't have that support, um, many people are going to go away. I struggled myself very much, alhamdulillah. I was blessed with a very wise man as a husband who guided me and supported me the right way. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, I had that. Please offer that and don't be judgmental. It took me a very long time for me to understand the hijab. And I, it was really, I was a rebel. I just want, because I was feeling that the ladies with hijab will treat me, oh, well, you are not really a Muslim because you don't wear the hijab. And, and then it was like them and I. No, it's, it, we are all judged individually and for our intentions. Please don't judge others. And please just be open-minded and, and help anyone who comes to Islam. Mashallah, Jazakallah khair. And to end with that, you know, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was a man who used to love drinking alcohol, right? And the Sahaba used to feel so agitated by this man because in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when, you know, alcohol has been prohibited, how can a human being still keep drinking, right? In his presence, doing it over and over again. So they would punish this guy in that society, and he would do it again, and he would do it again. And so one day the Sahaba were talking about him, like how can this individual be this way? And so the Prophet ﷺ heard the Sahaba talking about this man. And he went to them and he said, basically don't talk about him because that man loves Allah and his messenger. When the Sahabas heard this, some of them began to get so sad and they began almost to cry because they said, the Prophet ﷺ never said that about us. Do you understand? If the Prophet ﷺ said something about a human being, it's because Allah guided him to say it. Allah knows. And it was mentioned that that man loved Allah and his messenger. For Allah and the Prophet ﷺ to confirm that an individual loves Allah and his messenger, it's huge. But it was said about the man who was drinking. It wasn't said about the ones who were mocking him. When this man heard that the Sahaba were saying that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, you love Allah and His Messenger, he began to cry. And he asked Allah to cure him of this disease. And Alhamdulillah, the disease of the urge of wanting to continue drinking alcohol went away. Sometimes it's the mercy that someone has upon us, whether we're new Muslims or whether we're not Muslim, of the caring of a human being towards another human being that affects us the most. Because we're human, right? It doesn't matter what language we speak, what, you know, what part of the earth we're from. You identify with people who care for you and who are good for you. It is very sad for some of us to come into the deen of Islam. As one brother said, I didn't know racism until I became Muslim. This brother grew up in, in, in Jersey. In fact, he'll be with us tomorrow. <laughs> it was Abdullah Danny Hernandez, mashallah. He's an imam over there in Houston now. He said, you know, he grew up in the East Coast and everybody was from different backgrounds, different colors. And that's how you grew up. But as soon as he accepted Islam, 
he encountered racism amongst the ranks of the Muslims. That's when he found out what racism was. These are diseases, brothers and sisters, that this deen can do away with. And just because we're Muslim and we have this title doesn't mean that it just goes away. It has to be worked, right? So the same way we just don't give ourselves this title, whether we're born in Islam or whether we accepted Islam, just because we're Muslim, that's it, we're going to Jannah. We have to work. And our humble effort in being able to carry out this work um, with this organization, Islam in Spanish, comes from one ayah, and we'll end with this. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَا لَهُمْ وَيُدِلُّ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِ مَا يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, I had not sent a messenger except that he spoke in the language of his people. In order that he may make the message clear for them, then Allah guides whomsoever he wills and leads the stream whomsoever he wills. And he is the Almighty, the All-Wise. Allah Azza wa Jal chose people from amongst their own people with their language to go and give them guidance. We don't mean to say that this is ethnic and this is because of our skin color, because as you can see, we're different skin colors. This is not something, this is not wataniya, this is not nationalism. Because this brother is from Brazil, he's from Colombia, he's from Mexico, he's from Puerto Rico, right? So we're not from the same country. We're not from the same race. But we do share something, which is the language. And because we have the Spanish language, and because of that ayah in Surah Ibrahim, we know that responsibility lies upon us to utilize that language to convey the message. Now some people may know English, but they don't know Ibanics. Do you know what Ibanics? Ab Abdul, Abdul Shahid, huh? You know Ibanics? <laughs> oh, he's from Patterson. Okay, you pass. Maybe, maybe you and Brother Shahid are the only ones know Ibanics over here. So you see, you, you can't just go into s some hood and talk to someone in English, you know, if you went to a university and so on. They're not going to see you as their own, right? If you start getting down with them and you use some slang and so on, and they see that you're down, then they may feel you. Right? So it's not even the English. It's the way you convey the information. So brothers and sisters, this is just a reminder for each and every one of us. Whatever language you have, you have a responsibility to go back to whoever it is and spread this message. Now it's not only to those people, it's to us as human beings in general. And with that, brothers and sisters, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm done and we're done and I don't want to keep you. I know that the brother mentioned we can have up to 10, 15. Alguien se le perdón la llaves? Pero okay. <laughs> Somebody lost their keys or so. Uh, MashaAllah. They have about 30 keys here. They Brothers. Told it was a key because that's the or the Latinos to carry a lot Okay. Of that's Abdul Shahid. That's Abdul Shahid. Uh, brothers and sisters, tomorrow we have an open house here. We have an open house here tomorrow. Um, please, if you know someone who knows Spanish, invite them. It's going to be at 11:30 right next door. Uh, it's called the Islamic Roots and the Latino Culture. We're going to detail for Latino people how our roots trace back all the way to Al-Andalus. Whenever more than... That's the reason why we have more than 3,000 words in the Spanish language from Arabic roots. Uh, much of the architecture, much of the history uh, from our roots as Latinos trace back to Islam. And all we're trying to let these people know is that Islam is not something from the Arabs or from people from South Asia. It is as much theirs as it is anyone else's. And... <laughs> MashaAllah, this brother did a DNA test and he traced himself all the way back over there. So Jazakallah khair brothers and sisters, please make dua that Allah uh, accept. Uh, there is no success if Allah doesn't accept, right? So only and truly success lies in the hands of Allah. And we ask Allah to forgive us for our shortcomings and to bring our hearts together as brothers and sisters and that we worship Him alone and please Him in our actions in this dunya. Jazakum Allahu khayran wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa sharu Allah ilaha 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 ilaha